She can even put cheese in her potatoes, and I eat it. <laughs> and not know what it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's good to be here with you folks. We really appreciate the opportunity to come and show our little presentation in the morning. Get a chance to preach at night. Hallelujah. And God is good to us, isn't he? Hallelujah. And uh, I was thinking as my wife was testifying, you look around in this world today and everything seems to be falling apart. Not only physically, the weather is changing, the ice is melting, which is probably a good thing considering how cold it feels out there tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, the world is falling apart. The fish stocks are dying. There's strange things happening in the oceans. You, know, you never know what you're going to hear from one day to the next. And diseases and pestilence coming on the face of the earth. Uh, you know, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Hallelujah. But there is a church that recognizes the times. Who was it, the tribe of Issachar, that had an understanding of the times? The church has an understanding of the times. And as such, we really need to open our spiritual ears and our spiritual eyes and recognize that God is going to do something in these last days. He's going to work a work of righteousness, cut it short. But God is going to do something in these days, and he has got to do it through his church. Hallelujah. And... You know, it's hard to believe that I've been in the church for 50 years now. A half a century I've been in the church. When I first got saved, I kept looking up at the clouds because I expected the Lord to come back at any time. But I guess he wasn't quite done, hallelujah, with what he wanted to do. And even going out west and driving a bus there in the oil sands this fall, there were people out there that... When I met them three, four years ago, they didn't seem to have much of a spiritual perspective. But their attitude is changing. And they're realizing that there is something taking place. This world knows that the world cannot go on the way that it's going on. Because resident within the heart of every individual is a law of God that he has placed upon the, stone of the, the tables of our hearts. Hallelujah. And people recognize holiness and unholiness. They recognize the fact that there is a spiritual battle going on in the heavenly realm. Hallelujah. Praise God. And as such, we as the church need to get our eyes open and realize that the battle we fight is not with flesh and blood. Hallelujah. There's times when I wished it was flesh and blood. Hallelujah. But we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, and high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world. And many times when you meet people, what they say and what they do against you is not really of their own motivation. It's because there is a spirit in them that raises up against the Holy Ghost in you and me. Hallelujah. There is an antichrist spirit that begins to make itself felt and known. And you and I need to just about figure it out that God has given us power and authority over those things. And when we walk into a situation, that situation can be changed because we are there. Not because we are anything great or spectacular, but because we are the agents of the mighty God of this universe. Hallelujah. Praise God. And, uh, you know, you walk around the churches nowadays and you see a lot of old white heads. Hallelujah. Amen. And if they're not white, then maybe they're not showing at all. <laughs> Hallelujah. But where there's an old white head, there should be a lot of wisdom. There should be a lot of understanding. There should have been a lot of experiences to get you to that point. And it's time that we began to realize that God has placed something within us. That we can walk into situations and change those situations. 
Hallelujah. That we can learn to obey God. We talked about Sister Agassi there this morning. Came out of a little Chinese doctor's place, full of cancer. And Sister Stowe just felt led of the Lord to lay hands on her. Laid hands on her, and she never saw her for a year or so. But God healed that woman instantaneously. And as we get closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, there are going to be some unexplainable things that begin to crop up. But the secret of the thing is to realize that we are warriors in this great spiritual battle and that if you are a warrior, you should have your ears open to hear what the commands are. Hallelujah. Because there is a voice of the Spirit. There is a direction and leading of the Spirit that we need to be searching for constantly. When you got saved, you just didn't get saved to look pretty and sat on a Pentecostal pew. When God saved you, he saved you and me for a purpose. And from that point onward, we become servants of God. We recognize that we are no longer our own. We're bought with a price. We recognize that God desires to make servants out of every one of us so that we can then listen to the voice of the Master and go and do that which God speaks to us about. Hallelujah. And we... Ah. Sometimes my mouth can't go as fast as my spirit goes. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Bring up my text there this evening, wherever it's going to show up here. Hallelujah. In the book of uh, 2 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, I'm going to read a portion of verse 8 and then uh, verse 39. Hallelujah. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. Verse 39, Uriah the Hittite. I think I can preach a sermon out of that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there's one more verse over in First Chronicles. Hallelujah. If you could bring that up, verse 41. Uriah the Hittite. Okay. Here we go. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Every now and again, when you have filled yourself full of the word, there are things that come to your attention that you really don't know much about them. And I'm sure that every one of you who have been in the church any more than five or six years have discovered there, there are times when you have read maybe a portion of Scripture for 50 or 100 times, and the next time you read it, it jumps right out and grabs a hold of you and wrestles you down in the middle of the floor, and you begin to see things that you have never seen before. I love it when that spirit of revelation comes from the Word of God. Hallelujah. This book that we read is a unique book. I have been in that book for better than 50 years because I was brought up a good Baptist. And the more I study it, the more I realize I don't know anything. Hallelujah. Compared to the amount that there is in that book. Hallelujah. And so I get really excited when God begins to open my understanding and I see little things along the way. Hallelujah. Now, what I preach tonight may not be as deep or as long. Thank the Lord for that, is what I usually preach when I'm here. But it's like I tell my wife, I'm only here once a year. <laughs> After I go through those doors tonight, you won't have to put up with me for one more year. Hallelujah. Praise God. But I got to looking at this scripture one day, and, and it just jumped right out at me. And I began to search the rest of the. There were 37 of these men who followed David faithfully. Now, there was the captain of his host, Joab. He was a great man. He was a proven warrior. And I want you to know that every one of these fellows were warriors. They knew how to use the, the sword and the shield and whatever else that they picked up. They were well-trained in the use of these things. And you don't become well-trained in something unless you have it in your hand, unless you're putting it to active work, unless you're practicing. These fellows that play basketball... They wouldn't have any problem at all getting around me. Hallelujah. 
In fact, most of them could just stand up and reach over the top of my head. No trouble at all. But in order to become skillful with anything, whether it is in this physical world or in the spiritual sense, we need to exercise. The Bible says having your senses exercised by use to discern both good and evil. That means that there is a realm where God desires us to enter into where we're not just you know, walking through them all just because we realize there's a sale on and it's Black Friday. The only reason that a person could want to go to the mall is so they could listen to the voice of God and God could speak to you and say, that person right over there, they are going through a spiritual battle and you need to go over and speak to them. We need to realize that God did not save us to sit on a pew or walk through the mall or spend all our time on Facebook or shopping. God saved us to become implements of His Expanding kingdom. Hallelujah. Now, there's 37 men. Joab was the head man. He was more skillful and, and had more understanding of warfare than anybody else. Underneath him were three men who had, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, had ascended to that point where they were skillful at what they did. And they were proven warriors. Hallelujah. Some of these fellows in the top three and then the next three underneath them. A jumping one fellow killed 300 Philistines with a sword and it was, it was so great a battle that when he got done, he couldn't even get the sword out of his hand. Hallelujah. These men, one fellow went down in a pit on a snowy day and killed a, killed a lion. Another fellow killed two lion-like men of Moab. But these men were proven. And the Bible says one particular thing in, in one of those portions of Scripture that I read from. It said, he had a name. Hallelujah. I want to tell you something. Every one of us have a name. Now, your name may not be very good, or your name might be really good. Everyone has a reputation. People know you. When you talk about certain individuals, they say, oh, yeah, I know all about him. He's got a name. Amen. We've met a few of those fellows over the years, haven't we? Hallelujah. But I recall Paul, hallelujah, and Peter and some of these fellows that had a name. People knew what they represented. In fact, the devil even knew because the seven sons of Sceva one day went to cast the devil out of a fellow because they had heard tell that Paul done things like that and Peter done things like that. And the devil spoke back to them and said, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? In other words, what reputation do you have? What is it that you have arrived at in your spiritual walk that you think you have authority over me? Well, that tells me one thing, that Paul had a name even in the kingdom of Satan. He was recognized as a warrior, as one who knew how to bring about victory. Hallelujah. And when he walked into a town or a city, the demons begin to get uncomfortable. When Jesus walked into a town or a city, the devils begin to cry out and said, We know who thou art. Thou art come to torment us before our time. Hallelujah. Because Jesus had a name. And Paul had a name. And you and I have a name. Hallelujah. These warriors, they had a name because they engaged in a warfare, a physical warfare in the Old Testament, but they were trained warriors, and when they appeared on the scene, something happened. Hallelujah. They weren't just out there whining and crying, but they picked up the sword. They picked up the spear. One man stood in a patch of lentils. Hallelujah. When all the rest of the men around forsook him and run away, and he defended that old pile of Lentils, whatever a lentil is supposed to be. Hallelujah. But he made up his mind. I am here. This belongs to God. This ground I'm standing on is holy ground, and I'm not going to let it go regardless of how many Philistines come against me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, underneath the captain of the host, Joab. There were three who were really superb individuals. Then there were three more individuals slightly below them. Didn't have quite the reputation, but they still made a name for themselves. 
Now, we read through that chapter very lightly, and we say, oh, well, might as well just skip that because that's this name and that's this name. It's like old Brother Dudley used to say, if you can't pronounce it, just call it cauliflower and keep on going. Hallelujah. But there's names there that's hard to pronounce. But the thing is, these 37 names are specifically named out of all of the armies of the warriors of Israel. Hallelujah. In other words, what it is saying is these men have superseded all the rest of those men. And they got their name in the word of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And uh, it, it ought to challenge us to realize that we can have our name written in the Lamb's book of life and that there may be a book already filled halfway full in heaven of the things that you and I have accomplished in this Christian walk. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is real good at making notes. <laughs> Hallelujah. The older I get, the more notes I've got to make. <laughs> because if I don't, I'm going to figure, forget everything in the country. Hallelujah. But the only problem is I get the notes all made, and then I forget where I put them. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I think some of you have been there as well. Hallelujah. So, so don't look at me with a strange look on your face. <laughs> but God is good at making notes, keeping entries in a proper place. Hallelujah. There were some people in Jerusalem that moaned and groaned because of the condition of the spirituality of Jerusalem. And God told the angel, write this down. Hallelujah. Make a note. These fellows are concerned about the spiritual climate of Israel. So write something down. Hallelujah. And I get excited because in amongst all of this bunch of fellows is a lad by the name of Uriah. Now, there's a couple of reasons I get really excited about Uriah. Number one, Uriah was called the Hittite. Hallelujah. And, of course, that doesn't mean a thing to you yet, but it will eventually. When God began to bring judgment upon the land of Canaan, he spoke to the children of Israel, spoke to Moses, and he said, when you folk go into the land of Canaan, I want you to destroy every Hittite that is there, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and all the rest of these folks. But the judgment of God was upon these Hittites. God said, clean them right out of the land entirely. Get rid of every one of them, because they are worshiping false gods. And their iniquity has grown to a point where I am bringing you fellows in to judge them. Amen. And there's a little bit of a lesson in that too. Because sometimes God brings you into a situation where there's a lot of ungodliness going on. And he brings you in there, whether you open your mouth or not, so that you begin to judge those individuals. My wife just spoke of this lady that she worked with. Well, she's not much of a lady, mind you. But that's her problem. But God will bring us into a situation so that a person has no recourse or no excuse whatsoever for living the way that they're living. You walk into the presence of somebody who is just absolutely given over to sin, and you know what will happen immediately? The Holy Ghost that's in you will begin to disturb the spirit that is in them. The spirit of the enemy, the spirit of Antichrist that is in them. A spirit of humanity that is given entirely over to sin. And God will begin to judge that individual because you are there in the situation. You may not even have to open your mouth, but they begin to suffer from that judgment of God. Hallelujah. And you know what they say. Wherever Paul went, he either had a revival or a riot. If we are not disturbing people, they will be content to live in the same state that they've always been, justifying their actions, justifying their sin. When, <laughs> hallelujah, oh Lord, here I come, I'm going to upset their apple carts. But if we never ever open our mouths, sometimes we can affect them that way, but you open your mouth. 
And you begin to tell them about the goodness of God. You begin to tell them that God desires to deliver them. That God desires to change them. That God will put their families back together. Hallelujah. And there is something that takes place because we have entered into a spiritual warfare. Hallelujah. And we may not be specifically addressing the person that we're talking to. We may be talking to the spirit that is hindering them. I'm sure that some of you folks have had an experience like this. You come into somebody's presence, and maybe you don't say anything about the things of God. And all of a sudden, they'll open their mouth, and they'll say something just as mean and miserable that has no bearing whatsoever on the conversation. Why did that suddenly pop out? Because there is a spirit in them that is reacting against the Holy Ghost that is in you. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the strange thing about the world in which we're living right now is that people are beginning to call evil good and they're beginning to call good evil. They are trying every way they can and have been for years to try to make the church and people of God look like total idiots. The televisions, the movie screens, when they portray a preacher, they don't portray him as a fine, outstanding member of the community. They portray him as some not that pastors a bunch of rednecks. Hallelujah. Because the spirit of the world is trying to war against everything that is good that God made. Every part of God's perfect creation, the enemy is trying to bring them down. So when Pentecost first came to the Miramichi River Valley, and I'm sure over in this area as well, what'd they call us? Holy rollers. Holy rollers. Hallelujah. And I'm not referring to the things the ladies used to put in their hair <laughs> on Saturday nights. So they look pretty on Sunday. But they, they tried to bring a stigma upon the people of God. Brand them. Put them in a little box where they could make fun of them as bad as they could. Well, out of all those fellas in that list, it tells where a lot of the other fellas came from, what city they came from. But when it got to Uriah, he said, oh, yeah, that's Uriah the Hittite. I wonder why they present him in that manner. Well, I'll tell you, as far as I know, God said, destroy the Hittites. When the children of Israel came into Egypt, or came out of Egypt and into the promised land, they were not able to drive out all of the tribes. And some of those tribes, the Bible said, remained them amongst them until this day. One of those tribes was the Hittites. Now, just in case you didn't know it, ha, do you know what the name Hittite means in the Hebrew? It means one who prostrates himself. Because the Hittites worshipped false gods. And they prostrated themselves. They threw themselves on the ground, on their face, and worshipped a god that was made out of stone or wood or whatever manner that they built that god out of. Their god was not the one true god. They prostrated themselves to the point that God said, I'm going to bring judgment in upon these fellows and remove them from the land. Amen. And the method of removing them was not entirely successful because God's will was for the children of God to totally remove them from the land. And I might say that that possibly might be the situation that we're in in North America tonight. Because there's a whole lot of sin around us. And it's interesting that in these areas where there are more United Pentecostal churches than anywhere else, there is a greater liberty to worship God. Now, we've sort of got a, a portion of deliverance from the power of the enemy. I recall many years ago when I was pastoring a little church in Newcastle. And uh, Brother Mel Calhoun was pastoring the church up in Bathurst. And they had gone from the time that, that church started up to that point, And nobody ever received the Holy Ghost in Bathurst. 
If they wanted somebody filled with the Holy Ghost, what did they do? They'd bring them over to Fredericton. They'd take them up to Harvey Camp. They'd bring them to McNamee or Doketown Pentecostal Church where there was more freedom in the spirit, where the powers of evil had been broken. And they would bring them into those places and they would receive the Holy Ghost and then go back to Bathurst. But I was there the night that Brother Calhoun had a speaker in. And that speaker was, what's his name? Hooper, Rufus Hooper. And he had a ministry of getting people prayed through the Holy Ghost. And that night in the service, when he asked how many wants the Holy Ghost, there were 12 people who raised their hands. And, of course, the old building there was just a long, narrow thing like a mini home. And he said, okay, line up back that aisle. They lined up back that aisle, and he came over, and he started back the aisle, just receive the Holy Ghost, receive you the Holy Ghost, receive you the Holy Ghost. By the time he got to the back of the line, nine of them were speaking in other tongues. He came back, and he worked with the other three, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And all 12 of them were filled with the Holy Ghost when they left that place. Why did that happen? It happened because there was an authority invested in him. He had a faith that he believed God could tear down that level of demonic oppression. And something happened. Hallelujah. Now, that can afflict us to the point that we will never even open our mouths or we will take that little Bible study that some of you have already got this evening and we will shove it into our purse or shove it into our pocket and forget about it for the next six months. But what I'm telling you is that this is the day when God desires to do a great work. He's looking for warriors that are going to stand up and say, You may call me a sinner. You can talk about me any way you want to. You can call me a Hittite if you want to. But I'm one of God's warriors. Hallelujah. You might as well tell the devil, I am a threat to your kingdom. Amen. Hallelujah. And the interesting thing about Uriah is that even though he had been one who prostrated himself, somewhere along the line, he began to see the power of Almighty God amongst the children of God. And he said, if I'm going to prostrate myself, I'm going to prostrate myself to the one true God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He got his priorities straight. He got his attitude and his mind changed. Hallelujah. And this kind of an interesting thing. You know, on the radio every now and again, you hear, we're counting down the top 30. Consider this. One of the top 30 underneath the other seven was a Hittite. And if a Hittite can hit the top 30, what ought we to do? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many times we miss out because we're content with where we're at or we're so insecure that we never, ever attempt to do anything. Now, the other interesting thing that I discovered when God began to open my eyes, why was he called Uriah? Hallelujah. Because Uriah is not a Hittite name. When I was in India, everybody that got converted from the Hindu religion, when they came into an experience with God, do you know the first thing they done? They changed their name. And we had Peters and Pauls and Zachariah and everything else amongst the Bible school students over there. And the interesting thing about that was also, when they became a Christian, it elevated them one position on the caste system. If they had been an untouchable prior to that, they then jumped up to that first or second level of the caste system. I want you to know something. Whenever God saved you, God promoted you. The Bible says that at one time we were in this world and we were of this world, but the Bible says that God set us in what? Heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We got promoted. When we came to God, we got promoted. In fact, the angels had a big old jam session the night that we came to the altar. Hallelujah. 
Heaven rejoiced when God's mercy and grace lifted us out of where we were and put us into a heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, Uriah had a new name. And we sing that song every now and again. Not near as much as what we used to, but there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, it's mine. And that ought to make you shout, hallelujah. Even after 50 years, I like to sing that song every now and again because I realize that when I repented of my sins and God filled me with his spirit, that I got set in heavenly places and I got a new name, hallelujah, hallelujah. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, what is his name and what is his son's name? Hallelujah. His name is Jesus. And guess what his son's name is? John, Bonner, Theodore, Jesus. Hallelujah. Because I got a new name. I was baptized into the kingdom of God. I was adopted into the family. I became an heir and a joint heir. And I received a brand new name. And the world can run around. And the devils can run around. And they can say, oh, yeah, that's the same old Bonner along. And God comes along and says, this is my son. He's got a new name. Hallelujah. Uriah was not a Hittite name. It was a Jewish name. So when he got into an experience somewhere along the line and learned who he ought to be prostrating himself to, he got himself a good name. Hallelujah. And he became a worshiper of God. And he made up his mind, I'm just not be to, to be content with being one of these ordinary fathers in the army. I'm going to hit the top 30. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of interesting. But in the beginning, the first portion of Scripture that I mentioned there was while David was out in the wilderness fleeing from Saul. And he went to the holes and the mountains and caves and wherever else, ended up in the cave of Adullam. Cave of Adullam was quite a spot. It had a bunch of rocks around the outside edge of it, so it was difficult to find the entrance to the cave. And as you went in, you had to sort of duck down and crawl in a ways. But as you went into that cave, it gradually got bigger and the, the height of the ceiling got higher. And then you came to this monstrous great big cavern. And that cavern was big enough to put 1,000 men in comfortably. And off the sides of that cave, there was little caves here and there. It was a great spot. And those fellows that went out, what kind of people were they? They were distressed. They were in debt. They had all kinds of problems. What kind of people end up in Pentecostal churches? Problem people. People who realize... God never intended for me to face this by myself. And I am unable to face this life by myself. Now, the pretty people are in the Baptist churches and the Catholic churches and everything else. Ha! But you get yourself a cave and you call it United Pentecostal. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you're going to get all kinds of people that's in trouble, all kinds of people that's in debt, all kinds of people that are struggling in their lives. But what does God do? God says, well... I got a cave experience for you. And if you will get into here on the ground floor and stay here. And stay here. How many times in the book of Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, have you read and it said a certain king, these are the acts of that king, the first acts and the last acts. A lot of those kings done well when they first came into the kingship. But somewhere along the line, they lost out. Hallelujah. But there were a few of them. They were there in the beginning. They were there in the middle. And they were there to the very end. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the th reason I read these two portions of Scripture was because Uriah was there in the beginning, in the wilderness experience. Uh, 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 
fleeing from the armies of Saul, running from one place to another, hiding in the woods, hiding in a cave. When they get an opportunity to run out of bread, they went down over the hill and they asked the priest if he had any bread in the temple. He said, well, we've got the show bread here. But God provided for them in the wilderness. When we first get in church, do you know everything that's going on? No. It's like a wilderness to you. But God tells us, follow him. Hallelujah. And the last scripture that I had up on the board here, it was at the end, nearly, of David's reign. And guess who was there? Uriah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was preaching up in Toronto one time. And I was really struggling. I was I was a little bit depressed and down a bit. And, uh, you know, I was wondering how I was going to manage to preach the service that night. And I was walking back and forth about an hour before the service went in and just uh, talking to God a little bit. And God was talking to me. And he spoke to me. And he said, listen, for all that you've gone through, you're still here. And I got happy about that. And I said, devil, <laughs> you've tried your best, and I'm still here. Hallelujah. <laughs> I might have been in the cave. I might have had my battles, but I'm still here. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And you fellas are still here. Look at that old Cammy Munn back there. He jumping. He was here 100 years ago when they first built this. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he's still here. Amen. Hallelujah. One day, Uriah was out fighting against the enemy. And there was a message came from the king. I want you to come to the palace. David was getting up in years, and they had already warned him that you really don't need to be out there. You know, a brother of uh, Goliath tried to kill him one day, and Ishbi ben Alb, I think, might have been his name. But one of the warriors, one of the top 30, killed that giant. And so they advised David, David, you're getting too old to be out here leading the army. Let Joab do that, and you stay at home. And the king, that's the worst place he could have been, because when he went out on his porch one night and looked across, there was a lady, Uriah's wife, and you all know the story. But Uriah came when the king sent a message saying for him to come back to the palace. And when he came to David, David took him in and he prepared a real lovely supper for him. There was lemon pie and everything else there, Sister Trail. Hallelujah. And <laughs> potatoes with cheese. <laughs> Hallelujah. And after the party, he made him drunk with wine and said, now you go down to your house. And Uriah went just outside the gate of the palace and slept on the ground. And I believe that happened twice. Yes. And when they questioned Uriah, Uriah said, how can I go home and enjoy the comforts of my house when God's people are out there fighting the enemy? Now, I'm going to tell you something. It is not always a pleasant experience when you and I become servants of God. Because from that point on, it's not my will, but it's his will. And you may be inconvenienced, but don't forget, you're a warrior. When you get on your knees, hell trembles. When you begin to intercede, something takes place. God just sort of says, hey, come here. He beckons an angel over. And he says, you go down and begin to work that situation out because this warrior is fighting. Hallelujah. Praise God. So Uriah said, how can I go home and enjoy the comforts and enjoy my wife when the people of God are fighting the enemy? And so he slept at the gate of the palace. And, you know, 
David couldn't get rid of him that way. So he gave him a little letter and sent him back to Joab. And when Joab got the letter, you know what it said. Put him in a place where everybody is fighting for all they're worth and then everybody else withdraw so that the enemy will kill him. Now, that may seem an unkind and unfair thing, but if you want to keep your life, you got to lose it. It is never pleasant for us to have to sacrifice our lives for the cause of the kingdom. Whether we think it's right or wrong, whether we think it's fair or not fair, there is a principle that he must increase and I must decrease. So here he carries his own death penalty into the battle. The battle is severe. He ends up dying in the battle. But I want you to notice the pattern here. Because when Uriah came to the palace, the first thing he did was he supped with the king. He enjoyed a time of fellowship with the king. And when he left the presence of the king, where did he go? Just outside the gate. He stayed with the king. Didn't even go back to his own house. He didn't go back to the thing that would have made him most comfortable. He stayed near the king. And when he had supped with the king and stayed near the king, what did he receive? A letter, and he was sent by the king. Hallelujah. And when he went back to the battlefield, he sacrificed for the king. So he supped, he stayed, he was sent, and he sacrificed. Hallelujah. What more perfect plan is there in that scripture, in that book that you and I have read for years and years and years. When we begin to recognize we are not our own, we are bought with price. Wherefore, glorify God in your body and spirit, which are the Lord's. It's not always pleasant to glorify God in your body and your spirit. But God requires that. And our peace of mind requires that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when we recognize I am a warrior in the kingdom of God, I'm not just some local yokel who works three hours a day and then I've got my time off from God. I am a warrior 24 hours of the day, seven days of the week, 365 and one quarter days of the year. I have been called into the army of God. And therefore, I must work the works of him that sent me. Hallelujah. Jesus provided a perfect example of how to be a successful servant. And if he had to pray, I must work the works of him that sent me. You and I need to pray. I must work the works of him that sent me. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, I'm almost at the end of my dissertation tonight. But I want to tell you this. If you and I don't fight for the kingdom of God, for the people of God, we will fight with the people of God. There's times when I don't think things are fair. When I look around and see some churches that are so monstrous and huge that they've got 17 preachers sitting on the platform and 17 more sitting back in the pew. And I've got to haul the money out of my pocket or my little credit card and go 14,000 kilometers around the earth to preach to a handful of tongues. Sometimes I wonder, 
Couldn't they share a little bit of that with me? But I am not the judge of what takes place in the kingdom of God. I cannot even judge another man's servant. And therefore, I cannot judge another servant of God. But what I need to do, I need to sup with the king. I need to stay close to the king. I need to be sent by the king regardless of what takes place. And I need to sacrifice for the kingdom of God. That's my responsibility. And my peace of mind depends upon me fulfilling the will of God to the best of my ability. And if I do not maintain that attitude of sacrificing and fighting for the people of God, rebuking the enemy, tearing people out of their sins, some save with compassion making a difference, others save What's it say? It's pulling them, snatching them from the fire. That's my responsibility. I am sacrificing for the people of God. And if I sit down and say, I've done this enough. I've got 15 trips in there, well, 14 so far, and one more coming up. But if I ever sit down and say, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to enjoy my old age and sit in the shopping mall over there in the food cart and do nothing the rest of my life. You know what will happen? It won't be very long before I'll be picking and backbiting and criticizing, criticizing everybody in the country. If there is no outlet for the spirit of the warrior that God places within us, we will begin to fight with the people of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> Woo! She's getting quiet in here now. But I got one more thing I want to tell you. Do you know what the name Uriah means? In the Old Testament, the most sacred name of God, Jehovah God, was J-A-H. And Uriah means the fire of Yah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Does that tickle your fancy just a little bit? Because everywhere Uriah went, he'll say, Ha <laughs> ha, you fellas are in for a fight because I'm the fire of God. Hallelujah. I am the fire of God. You fellas just might as well haul in your horns, surrender your arms, because I am the fire of God. I might be classed as a Hittite. The world might talk about me any way they want to. They can label me with anything detrimental that they can think of. But I want to tell you something. I'm not only a Hittite. I am Uriah. I'm the fire of God. Hallelujah. And whenever I begin to act like the fire of God, Something's going to happen. I'm not in the second or third army back. I'm in the top 30 because I am the fire of God. Hallelujah. When you go to the shopping mall next week or whenever you go down to Maine to enjoy all your Black Fridays, hallelujah, when I go to Maine, if it's a Black Friday, I make sure it's a White Friday before I'm done because there's going to be somebody over there that I am going to be able to tear from the arms of the enemy because I am the fire of God, hallelujah. I am a warrior in the kingdom of God. I'm not content to sit back and just enjoy my own old age in my retirement. I'm going to be there from the first and I'm going to be there till the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know that you and I have that same attitude. Hallelujah. Some of you fellows have been here for a long time. Hallelujah. Praise God. And you may not get out of this life without having a few medical problems, without having a few problems with your health. But even as you're hobbling, hallelujah, from one bench to another, you can still say, devil, there's a warrior coming. I'm the fire of God. I know how to pray. I know how to contact God. Hallelujah. And devil, you just might as well haul your horns in because I'm coming through. Hallelujah. 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 I want you folks to know tonight that we are somebody. 
We are somebody in this earth. Hallelujah. The angels. What's the scripture say about the ministering angels in Hebrews? It said in the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister? What? What? Okay. I got you on that one. Because it doesn't say to minister to the saints. It says to minister for the saints. Hallelujah. That means that there's a whole band of angels setting up there right close to the throne of God. And God is just waiting for one of us to say, God, I need this situation changed. I need this loved one saved. I need an answer to prayer here. And God said, hey, angel, come here. Come here. You've got to go minister for them. Because everything that happens in the natural is a reflection of what is happening in the spiritual. Praise God. Because we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. I cannot heal you. I cannot save you. But I know one who can. And the way he does that is he promotes spiritual warfare in the heavenly realm. And his angels come and they begin to war against what happened in Daniel's day. It talks about Michael, the angel, and it talks about the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia was hindering the movement, the fulfillment of the will of God. So God said, hey, Michael, come on over here. There's a problem down there. Michael came down. Now, there was quite a little battle in the heavenlies because it took 21 days to overcome the prince of Persia. But Daniel got his answer. And the fulfillment of the things that he saw in the Spirit of God are still taking place today. Pretty near 3,000 years later. Hallelujah. You and I are somebody. And if we can get that in our hearts and minds, I am walking into the situation. And the situation is going to change because I am the fire of God. Hallelujah. When I pray, something happens. When I go to Tonga, something happens. When I go to Vanuatu, something happens. Am I something great? <laughs> You're right. I'm a son of God. I am a warrior in the kingdom of God. His name has been applied. I've got a new name. Praise God. But I need to remember who I am. And you need to remember who you are. You are saved for a purpose. If God wanted somebody other than you, he would have saved somebody other than you. Hallelujah. So you just might as well make up your mind that you are irreplaceable. And when you come through those doors back there on prayer, need, prayer meeting night or Sunday morning or Sunday night or midweek service, you march in with your shoulders back and say, okay, I am the fire of God. Something is going to happen. When you come to the altar and you raise your hands, you say, I am the fire of God, and the fire is going to fall here in this place tonight. When you go up into the shopping mall, you say, I am the fire of God. God, where is the biggest point of the battle? Because I want to be in it. I may not survive in that battle, but I'm going to tell you one thing. The kingdom of God is going to survive. Do you believe what the Word teaches? Hallelujah. Of course you do. And God has been trying for years to get some of us just to open our mouth and do what He wants us to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, please stand on your feet right now. And I'll invite you to come up around the altar. Hallelujah. Everybody in this place, if you're able to make her up the aisle.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All you that are able, please come around the altar tonight. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 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 Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell the enemy right now, I am the fire of God. Let's, let's hear that tonight. I am the fire of God. Repeat it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am the fire of God. Hallelujah. 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 God knows who we are. The angels know who we are. The demons of hell know who they are. And the enemy around about us knows who we are. Hallelujah. I am the fire of God. There is nothing that is impossible for them that believe the Lord. Hallelujah.